It's Friday, September 6th, and this is the Daily Medical News, where we bring you today's top medical headlines and take a closer look at the day's biggest story. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, an RNA interference drug drops LDL cholesterol levels by half. Patients with viral hepatitis are living longer. Michigan is the first state to ban flavored e-cigarettes. And clinicians are finding significant mental health challenges when treating immigrant children who are separated from their parents. Plus, a new approach could let doctors move at their own pace on maintenance of certification. The small interfering RNA drug in glycerin safely halved LDL cholesterol levels in more than 800 patients in a phase 3 multicenter study. The approach could offer an alternative way to harness the potent cholesterol-lowering power of PCSK9 inhibition. The Orion 11 trial enrolled more than 1,600 patients with cardiovascular disease, familial hypercholesteremia, type 2 diabetes, or a high Farmingham risk score. About half were randomized to inclycerin, which was administered as a semi-annual subcutaneous injection. Inclycerin targets the messenger RNA for the PCSK9 enzyme produced in hepatocytes. That cuts the cell's production of PCSK9 and pulls more LDL cholesterol from the blood. After 510 days, inclycerin patients saw an average LDL reduction of 54%. The time average reduction over 15 months of treatment was 50%. Virtually every patient treated with inclycerin saw a consistent drop in LDL. The rate of treatment emergent adverse events and serious events was virtually the same in the inclycerin and the placebo patients. And inclycerin showed no signs of causing liver effects, renal or muscle injury, or malignancy. Dr. Kosick Ray of Imperial College in London reported the study results at the annual Congress of the European Society of Cardiology in Paris. He says inclycerin could give doctors better control over medication adherence, and it may offer patients a safe and convenient new choice for lowering LDL cholesterol. Patients with viral hepatitis may live longer after treatment with direct-acting antiviral agents, or DAAs, but their risk of extra-hepatic causes of death may rise as a result. Those findings come from a study of mortality trends between 2007 and 2017 among patients with common chronic liver diseases, including viral hepatitis, alcoholic liver disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Stanford University researchers caution that viral hepatitis patients' rising extrahepatic mortality rate shouldn't be seen as a causal link with DAA use. Instead, the upward trend is more likely because of successful treatment with DAAs, which can increase lifespan. Mortality among patients with hepatitis C virus rose until 2014 and dropped thereafter. Mortality among those with hepatitis B virus steadily decreased over the study period. However, mortality for cardiovascular disease and diabetes among viral hepatitis patients increased, while the rate of extrahepatic cancer-related deaths held steady. While viral hepatitis therapy has improved markedly since 2014, the investigators note that treatments of alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease have remained static. Partly as a result, Mortality rates among patients with those two conditions increased at an accelerating rate over the 11-year study period. The findings appear in the journal Gastroenterology. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has ordered state health officials to issue emergency rules banning the sale of flavored nicotine vaping products in retail stores and online. Michigan Health Agency is expected to issue the rules within the next 30 days. The emergency ban will be in effect for six months, with the possibility of a six-month extension while state health regulators work on a permanent ban. The ban will also target what it calls, quote, misleading marketing of vaping products, including the use of terms such as health, safe, and clean. 
The band will cover mint and menthol flavors as well as sweet flavors, but the Great Lakes State won't ban tobacco-flavored e-cigarette products. Groups including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Lung Association, and the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network praised the state's action, calling it necessary and appropriate. The Daily News will be right back after this. Clinicians who treat unaccompanied immigrant children in federal custody face significant challenges when addressing those children's mental health needs, including overwhelming caseloads and some patients' deteriorating mental health. That's according to a new HHS Office of the Inspector General report. The report outlined findings from an analysis of 45 Office of Refugee Resettlement facilities between August and September 2018. The OIG found that providers delivering mental health care to the children faced numerous serious challenges. In particular, they cited overwhelming patient caseloads, as well as difficulty accessing external mental health clinicians and referring children to providers. Mental health clinicians reported that the high caseloads hurt their ability to develop rapport with young patients and the caseloads allowed less time for counseling and less frequent sessions for children with greater needs. The OIG made several recommendations for improving conditions. Among them, the Office of Refugee Resettlement should provide facilities with evidence-based guidance on addressing trauma in short-term therapy, and it should consider maximum caseloads for individual clinicians. Physician groups are praising a new option by the American Board of Internal Medicine that will offer doctors a self-paced pathway for maintenance of certification instead of the traditional long-form assessment route. Details are still being fleshed out, but the new longitudinal assessment option would allow doctors to acquire and demonstrate ongoing knowledge through shorter evaluations of specific content. The option would also provide doctors with immediate feedback about their answers, and it would share links to educational material to address knowledge gaps. ABIM officials say the move is recognition that some doctors may prefer a more continuous process that they can engage at their preferred pace, and they prefer one that allows them to access resources they use in practice. The new option is in line with recommendations by the American Board of Medical Specialties to update and improve the continuing certification process. Dr. Douglas DeLong is the chair of the American College of Physicians Board of Regents. He says it's clear that some of the principles of adult learning, like frequent information with quick feedback, repetition of material, and identifying gaps in knowledge, are how people learn most effectively. He adds that just cramming for an examination every decade hasn't ever really been shown to affect long-term retention of knowledge or even patient care outcomes. Dr. Alan Lichten is the chair of the MOC Working Group of the American Society of Hematology. He says that the self-paced pathway is a much-needed option, particularly the immediate feedback on test questions. This week's stories were contributed by Christopher Palmer, Lucas Frankie, Heidi Spleet, Jake Remily, Alicia Gallegos, Kari Oaks, Steve Semino, Richard Frankie, Mitchell Zoller, Mary Jo Dales, Bianca Nograde, Gregory Twachtman, and Will Pass. Our editors include Kathy Skarbeck, Denise Fulton, Katherine Hackett, Katie Lennon, Jeff Evans, Glenn Williams, Richard Pizzi, Therese Borden, Elizabeth Meshkati, Renee Matthews, Mark Lesney, and Laura Nicolaides. Our editor-in-chief is Mary Jo Dales. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. And I'm your host and the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Thanks for listening this week, and we'll see you next week.